Okay. Um, welcome to everybody who's joined already. I think I'm just going to go ahead and get started and people can just keep joining. Uh, so yeah, welcome to um, this meeting. It's our second virtual uh, talk for the Northwest Society. And um, uh, today we've got Professor Jonathan Martin from the University of Wisconsin, who is going to give us a talk based on his new book. So it's ex uh, quite excited about this talk, it'll be a good one. But first of all, there's just a few uh, uh, slides to go through. So um, our Mets are looking for uh, volunteers um, uh, just for your time to make some to make some virtual focus groups and to get your thoughts about um, their publication Weather Magazine and you'll be uh, paid for your time in Amazon vouchers. Uh, so if you're interested in taking part in one of these focus groups, um, please email Hannah McAllenson at rmets.org. Uh, next. Oh, and it's the RMET's annual atmospheric science conference um, this year, and it's virtual this year. And there are three dates, so one in June, one in July, one in September. And the overall theme of um, the event is atmospheric science for solutions. And so it's quite a broad topic, and um, RMET's are asking for you to submit abstracts um, on a variety of atmospheric topics. Um, and the deadline for submission is Friday the 23rd, so a week on Friday. Okay. Um, also, uh, there's the new um, Royal Meteorological Society blog um, launching soon. So if you want to sign up to the, that newsletter, it sounds quite good, actually. Um, so, yeah, head on over to the RMS website, um, forward slash metmatters, to... Uh, sign up for the newsletter and also if you're not become a member yet of RMETS uh, you can do so um, on the RMETS website under under membership <laughs> um, and then so uh, just quickly at the end of this at the end of um, Jonathan's talk we will do a Q&A session and the, you should see a chat area on the right hand side of your screen where you can ask questions and um, so you can ask them throughout the talk as you as you think of them and um, then at the end of the session I'll try and um, we'll try and answer as many as we can um, but there might not be time to answer them all cool so that's the end of those slides I think <laughs> um, so I think before um, before I introduce Jonathan and we get started with a talk, I thought I'd do a very quick weather briefing. And today that duty falls on me instead of Hugo. So apologies, I'm probably a bit rusty at this. I've not done it since, uh, well, undergraduate days. So that was a while ago. <laughs> um, so as we all know, we had quite a warm March followed by a very chilly Easter. And it's still very chilly now. Um, so uh, showing on the left hand side is the... Um, temperature anomaly for March of this year. So all those warm colors mean that we were above average pretty much across the board in the UK, in the UK for March temperatures. We even had some record breaking temperatures at the end, towards the end of the month. I think it was March the 30th when most of those rec records were breaking. Um, so for example, we had 23.4 degrees down in Cornwall, which is their record for the warmest March day. Um, but records were broken elsewhere in the UK as well. So um, looking at these two charts we've got here, um, again, for temperature, this is uh, Monday the 29th of March. And you can see we're in those warm colours here. Um, so, it was, yeah, nice and warm. Contrast that to a week later, and we're in these cold colours. So this is from uh, Easter Monday. Um, so we're being influenced by a different air mass here, and that's why it was just so much colder. Um, and this is the surface pressure chart for Easter Monday and you can see that there's two cold fronts pushing their way down across the UK um, with bringing with it really cold air from the Arctic if you follow the isobars up here we had like northerly flow air right over the UK and it's a nice example the um, demonstration that cold fronts mark the boundary between two air masses so we went from the warmer one um, and then the colder northerly one coming down and bringing with it all the cold weather we had for Easter. Um, and yeah, we've been sat in that cold 
air really ever since unfortunately so this is for sassy just gone and yep cold temperature is still in this cold kind of trophy bit here um and but lighter winds but still northerly flow again it's cold is what i'm trying to say <laughs> and you can see here from this um kind of upper level wind map you can see that the jet stream has sunk right to the south of us and we're in this kind of trough again indicative it's cold cold air arctic air mass is influencing us um and this is a picture i took from saturday uh in saddleworth so to the north of manchester and it was snowing that's why it's a bit hazy <laughs> this is snow <laughs> um and it's nice it's quite a really clear defined kind of snow line where um stuff was settling on these just these higher peaks here and on the hill that i was on so i wasn't expecting to go for a walk in the snow on saturday but that's what happened and so then just quickly looking to uh uh more of an outlook uh this is a fork this is this today's rain uh this is today's weather situation so um we're still under this cold air but there's kind of a ridge building in and there's a bit more warmer temperatures off to the side that as we go forward to thursday it looks like we're going to be slightly more influenced by these warmer temperatures but not nothing nothing spectacular unfortunately <laughs> um but a slightly warmer um out and this is a surface pressure chart for friday um so we don't have that kind of uh strong high pressure system that's been sitting over for a while so um this uh front is going to probably come over us and influence our weather a bit so it's going to be a bit warmer but also a bit more unsettled going forward um, yeah, so that's my weather brief, brief weather briefing. Um, so we should get started with the with the main event. So I think I can introduce Jonathan now. Hopefully he's still there and will appear. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so um, hello, excellent. Good so, evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Jonathan Martin from the University of Madison, Wisconsin. Jonathan is a professor of atmosphere and oceanic science, and he did his PhD in the University of Washington, also in atmospheric science. And his current research focuses are on middle latitude synoptic scale weather and atmospheric dynamics, cyclogenesis, all that kind of stuff. And he's written two books, the first of which I remember from my undergraduate, which is mid last year's atmospheric dynamics, a first course, which will be familiar to a few people who have studied um, mutuality at undergraduate level. And but this talk is on his second book, which is called Chasing a Giant. And I'll let Jonathan explain more. Thank you uh, for that uh, very generous introduction. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share with all of you uh, tonight some of the results of a life-changing journey that I've been privileged enough to take over the last six years of biographical research into the life and work of Reginald C. Sutcliffe. I think a case could be made that the cornerstones of modern synoptic dynamic meteorology are application of the quasi-geostrophic assumption to simplify the equations of motion and facilitate the generation of physical insight the adoption of pressure as the vertical coordinate in investigations of the structure and dynamics of the atmosphere and the development of a diagnostic equation for vertical air motions, which tell us whether the sky is clear or cloudy or precipitating or not. And I think though a number of insightful and creative scientists have made contributions to these foundations of our science in its modern form, a reasonable case can be made that Reginald Sutcliffe was the pioneer in all three of these revolutionary developments. And that's really the motivation for my work. Um, Sutcliffe was born on Wednesday, November 16th, 1904 in Wrexham, North Wales. There's a little red star there to indicate that location. Um, it was a fair and windless day in North Wales, which I think are relatively uncommon as far as I understand it. He was born in this home at 88 Bradley Road in Wrexham, which still stands. And his parents, Jesse and Ormerod Sutcliffe were not natives of Wales. They were from Hebden Bridge in Yorkshire. And Ormerod was the manager of the cooperative in Wrexham, having been involved in the cooperative movement for a number of years, ever since, in fact, his late teens. He had been working in factories as a young boy before then. And the Sutcliffe's had three sons in the 1920s. They'd lost their oldest, William, to disease when he was an infant in 1906. 
Robert was the, the surviving oldest, then Reggie, and then his younger brother, Alfred. Ormerod found that doing business in Wales was quite difficult for him because he never got a solid grip on the native language. So the family moved back to the Yorkshire town of Cleckheaton in 1907. And there's the Cleckheaton Town Hall, which was a source of civic pride, and it went up in the 1890s. And they traded 88, uh, rec uh, 88 Bradley Road for nine Prospect Terrace. The house looks exactly the same, and there it is in Cleckheaton. At the end of Prospect Terrace, turning to the left, there's a slow grade up the Whitcliffe Road. And about a half mile up this grade, was the Whitcliffe Mount Grammar School, which opened in 1910. And I had the privilege to actually see this old building when I visited in March of 2015. It's subsequently been uh, destroyed and a new, uh, more modern school has been built on the site. So I'm glad I got to see that. Uh, I think it was um, demolished in July of 2018. And it's rather sad for me that it's now gone, but the new school is better for the students, I suppose. The school has a very unique history. At the time of its opening in 1910, the several towns in the area were growing, and it became apparent that a new grammar school would soon be necessary, and local government administrators had decided to expand existing facilities in the neighboring town of Heckman Dwight. And this decision, of course, meant that Cleckheaton children would have to be commuting six miles each way every day for their schooling, and nobody in town was happy about that. And so a number of rich industrialists in Cleckheaton banded together to challenge that decision. They were quickly dubbed the Cleckheaton Conspirators, and the group proposed building a new school in Cleckheaton based on subscriptions, that is donations. And in very little time, they raised the requisite funds to do that. This remarkably anomalous effort for the time especially was motivated by a pervasive belief in the importance of a broadly available education. And that belief was articulated in a speech by one of the conspirators, Reginald Grills, 113 years ago yesterday in his own home. He said, we live now under a democratic form of government when everybody has a vote and it stands to reason that if the power to rule is given to many, while the faculty of reason belongs to the few, the government is not a democracy at all, but government by the mob. If we want to have a perfect system of democratic government, we must have an enlightened people. And were that the only reason for a complete and universal system of education, that in itself would be sufficient to justify every effort that is being made in improving our education. So Sutcliffe began his career at the Whitcliffe Mount School in September of 1916, and it was to have an enduring and substantial impact on him throughout his life. Here's a picture of some of the staff from 1920. Two of the more influential members of that staff in terms of Sutcliffe's life were the headmaster Herbert Claiborne in the middle and his science master William Pearson, who's to Claiborne's left, who had joined the staff right after World War I, so he started in the fall of 1919. Sutcliffe himself was a big man on campus. Here he is as captain of the football team in his sixth form year. He was also captain of the cricket team. In neither venture did he pilot those squads to winning seasons. They were miserable uh, in their competition, but he was a big man on campus. He was, a, he was um, the head boy, the top male prefect in the school, and he was a sports champion uh, in swimming and in running and various other things. Here are some of the medals he won while he was a student there, um, courtesy of his daughter, Ellen, who showed me these when I visited her. At the end of his sixth form year, Reggie Sutcliffe won a county major scholarship, and that was to pay for his attendance at the University of Leeds, in which, at which he enrolled in September of 1922. Now, the scholarship only paid for tuition and nothing more, so he was still living at Prospect Terrace while studying at Leeds. And so given the daily commute, about 12 miles back and forth, he had little time to experience college life, though he did swim. And here he is as a member of the swim team on the far right of this picture in 1925. And he also was the president of the Mathematics Society. And that afforded him a chance, his first chance, actually, at public speaking and after dinner speech. And it's the kind of engagement for which he would become quite famous later in his life. But the mathematics education that he got as an undergraduate left him hungry for more. There was nothing particularly creative or challenging about the pursuit that he explored as an undergraduate, according to him. He did very well, though, nonetheless, and Leeds invited him to continue on for a higher degree, but of course could not offer him any support by which he might do so. So enter the Whitcliffe Mount School again. Since Sutcliffe had won a county major scholarship to fund his undergraduate study, the schools number, a uh, number of, of the schools endowed scholarships, which had been established at its founding, had not been involved. 
And so this led both Claiborne and Pearson independently to suggest to Sutcliffe that he apply for the Alfred Law Scholarship from the school and make the argument that, hey, if you can afford to give me this scholarship, I'll become the first PhD graduate of the Whitcliffe Mount School. That argument worked. And so he began his PhD work in 1925, September 25 at Leeds. Um, and he became a, a student of Professor W.E.H. Berwick, who was a number theorist and an algebraist. And Sutcliffe couldn't have timed, of course, it was just dumb luck, but he couldn't have timed his arrival at Leeds for the graduate program at a better moment. Berwick was at his creative and, uh, and uh, productivity apex of his career at this time in the mid-20s. And so this was the perfect time for a young person to start research work with such a, a, a scholar. And uh, Sutcliffe remembers, as many of us probably do, uh, that when we start our research career, we don't really know what we're getting into. What is research anyway? What do you do? Do you have to solve a problem no one's ever thought about? How do you get going? And he recalled many years later perfect advice that came from Berwick. He said, I will always remember Berwick's introductory talk with me, in which he relaxed my tension by saying, don't worry too much about your research at this stage. The important thing is to start doing something. And I think that even in mid-career, late career, this is still excellent advice. There are times where we feel dead in the water after completing a project. What do you do next? Just start doing something. I think this is great advice, and it worked well for Suckler. Less than a year into his PhD work with Berwick, Berwick, who had come from the University College of North Wales as a former member of their staff, was offered the chair of the Department of Mathematics there. And so he decided he would take it. So he wrote a letter to the registrar, and here it is. It says, consequently, it'll be necessary for me to resign my appointment in the University of Leeds, the resignation to, be, to take effect 30 September 1926. This sent Sutcliffe scurrying. What do I do? He's talking to all of his professors in the department. He's writing to the registrar. And they all had, it was a unanimous opinion they gave back to him. And that was, follow Berwick to Wales. You'll get your degree with him, but it will be conferred from the University of Leeds. And that's the strategy that they took. So he set off for North Wales in September of 1926. He moved into this house at 37 Upper Goth Road, which is about a half a mile from the Manai Strait. And that's a beautiful region of that country. And um, he was, it was the first time he ever lived away from home. So it was an intoxicating period. He was a year into his PhD, beginning to see how the problem was evolving. He suddenly has this enormous freedom as a young man. And of course, he also meets a young lady from a Calvinist Methodist family who lived in Pentry Halkin, some 45 miles to the east, Miss Evelyn Williams. Evelyn was studying languages and was in her first year at the University College at North Wales. And by all accounts, Sutcliffe was instantly smitten by Evelyn, who was, of course, mostly indifferent. And in fact, her daughters tell me that uh, she was at the time interested in some local rugby hero. And, but Sutcliffe was persistent. Evelyn was an active, inquisitive, and progressive young woman, a qualities that she never abandoned and which never atrophied. So they were very well matched. And by the end of his only year in residence at Bangor, Sutcliffe completed his PhD under Berwick. And I believe I'm one of only a handful of people who have ever lived who have seen this PhD thesis. This is courtesy of his daughter, Jenny, who happened to have a copy of it, or a draft anyway. Listen to this title. It's Interpolation and Tabulation of the Numerical Values of Functions of a Complex Variable with a Digression on Certain Subgroups of the Modular Group and the Functions Associated with Them. I have no idea what that means, but the title is 30-some words long. The document itself is laden with carefully drawn, colorful figures that illustrate some of those, the graphical portrayals of some of these functions that he'd investigated. And all of this was done by Sutcliffe by hand, all by himself. There were reviewers' comments, and of course, none of us particularly liked them, but none of us can equally, we have to say, they always make things better. They do. But the comments reveal a fundamental characteristic, both of the Sutcliffe PhD work and, more importantly, of the subsequent work that was to come. And look at this. I've underlined it in red. Uh, you know, there's nothing fundamental uh, here or nothing novel. What a banal comment. But the, uh, the reviewer goes on to say, with a practical aim in view, the author does various things. And then these formula, which are undoubtedly of practical value. So there's a practicality to what Sutcliffe's doing, even in his PhD thesis. And you'll see that's a recurring theme in much of his work. Uh, Berwick, of course, thought he might work on similar problems in the future. He said, this makes a a useful addition to the theory initiated by Klein, on which I hope Sutcliffe will work in the future. And of course, Sutcliffe never did go back to applied mathematics. 
He graduated, though, in June of 1927, and as difficult as it may be to believe today, in the late 1920s, a PhD in mathematics was not, as it is today, a highway to many potentially lucrative job prospects. So the pickings were rather slim uh, for a newly minted PhD from Leeds. Luckily, there was a primitive placement office at Leeds, and Sutcliffe was friendly with the contact there, who informed him that the meteorological office often looked for mathematics graduates, so he should probably give them a ring. He, he took that advice, and he eventually arranged an interview at the Met Office's Kingsway headquarters. And that interview took place on Monday, September 5th, 1927. It was Sutcliffe's first day ever in London. And it was conducted by David Brunt, later to be Sir David Brunt, and lasted no more than five minutes. One gets the impression that Brunt was told by the higher-ups, if this individual is not a complete disaster in person, hire him. Uh, and that's what happened. So Sutcliffe was uh, offered the job, and he began what would be a distinguished Met Office career on, maybe it's a joke, Friday. Why start somebody working on a Friday? Anyway, they did at the Met Office, Friday, September 30th, 1927. And as I said, he'd never been to London before. He was only two years removed from living at home. And so there was another shot of this exciting uh, freedom and personal adventure that I think must have coursed through his veins in that fall of 1927, but this time tempered by some uneasiness as Evelyn remained back in Bangor. Family legend has it that in the next summer of 1928, Reggie took an extended bicycle trip all the way back to Bangor with his friend Jeffrey Mason uh, to visit Evelyn. And perhaps in response to this demonstration of serious intent, Evelyn's father, a preacher, insisted that Sutcliffe learn the Welsh language if he were serious about Evelyn. And he had at least a modicum of success, perhaps more than his father before him, but it was in any event apparently enough to satisfy his future father. -in -law. We'll talk more about that later. After about a year of meteorological office employment, during which Sutcliffe was charged with compiling statistics regarding air routes over the Mediterranean, he was sent to the tiny outstation at Malta. And Malta had just become a protector in 1922, and Mussolini had been in control of Italy for a number of years by this time and had, as his stated goal, reconquest of the Mediterranean, which was, of course, objectionable to, objectionable, uh, to the British who were particularly interested in ensuring they could quickly come to the aid of any and all of their strategic possessions and understanding Mediterranean weather and its effect on shipping and air travel was therefore a very high priority. So as luck would have it, Sutcliffe arriving in late November was just weeks after Tor Bergeron started a six month visit to Malta at the invitation of the meteorological office to explore the efficacy of the Norwegian analysis methods for forecasting in the Mediterranean. Now, of course, Bergeron took that opportunity, as he did around the globe, actually. He was the emissary of the Norwegian school to instruct uh, the five staff members that were in the Maltese, Maltese office on Norwegian methods. This reinvigorated Sutcliffe's lagging enthusiasm for meteorology as a science, because his first year of service in the Met office was hardly inspiring to a young, mathematically gifted young scientist. And in fact, he had begun to sour on the entire science as lacking any rigor or any physical mathematical foundation. So this interaction with Bergeron was an enormous shot of much needed intellectual adrenaline uh, for Sutcliffe. The following spring, Evelyn somehow made the trip down to Malta. We don't really know how. Um, maybe there was a Navy wife or somebody familiar with the family back in Wales who was heading that way and so she came with them. But anyway, she got to uh, Sliema uh, Malta in mid-March 1929, and she and Reggie were married on Tuesday, the 29th of March 1929. So here's their wedding photo, and there's the church, the Holy Trinity Church, in which they were married. And they uh, spent the next three years together in the subtropical beneficence of Malta, and some of the happiest years of their long lives together. And as his career started to unfold slowly at the Met Office, Sutcliffe was attracted to research, even though there was a prohibition against its pursuit during the regular workday at the Met Office. And despite this prohibition, though, it was well understood that doing research work, especially if it was interesting, was a means to attract the attention of higher ups and therefore perhaps lead to promotion. So Sutcliffe made a number of interesting, relatively low profile contributions during his first years at the meteorological office. He did an experiment where he daily changed the wick in muslin on a wet bulb thermometer and noticed that it makes a difference in the reported wet bulb temperature. Um, he looked at how do Atlantic ship observations have an influence on the forecasts they were making for Mediterranean weather? Um, there's a, a, a kind of recurring 
autumnal gravity wave phenomena at Malta. He looked at that, and then he also looked at rainfall in the, in the protectorate as well. It comes in big clumps. It's not distributed evenly over the course of the year. In 1932, he and Evelyn returned to England and that was in October, and they moved to Felixstowe for, for a duty that began in December of 1932. And he continued thinking about research work. He considered several problems of local interest, including the sea breeze. And in fact, a paper describing the results of that sea breeze research that was published in the Quarterly Journal in 1935 was read before a skeptical G.I. Taylor, one of the giants, by one of Sutcliffe's colleagues in November 1935 because Sutcliffe had been deployed to Alexandria in the fall of 1935 as part of the Abyssinian crisis. Uh, Mussolini was saber rattling about threatening Abyssinia or Ethiopia. And so the British amassed the largest fleet that had been assembled since the end of World War I. And Sutcliffe was in charge of whatever weather forecasting duties they seemed to need, uh, which wasn't too much during this uh, several month period. On a cruise to Palestine in 1935 at Christmas time, Sutcliffe found himself in Nazareth on Christmas day. And he bought this Rosewood Bible. He was not a person of faith himself, uh, in fact, became an avowed atheist, but he um, bought this Rosewood Bible. It's a beautiful artifact. I've seen it at Ellen's house, and it's inscribed to Ellen from her daddy in Nazareth for February 19th, 1936. A strange construction for someone with such a command of the English language. The reason is, is because he didn't know that his first child was going to be a girl, and they were going to name her Ellen. So this was inscribed much later and with the birth date on it. Ellen had no idea where this Rosewood Bible came from, or, or well, she knew that, I guess. She didn't know why her father was in Nazareth at Christmas time, 1935. So I had the thrill of finding this out for her and then sending her a message and say, this is why you have that Rosewood Bible. And so this family, family heirloom was explained by this research. So it's a real thrill to have those moments along the six year path. So when they, when he came back from um, uh, Alexandria, Sutcliffe was posted to the Air Ministry headquarters at Kingsway effective in late April, 1936. And Royal Air Force and private pilots were required to take elementary courses in meteorology for certification. And the meteorological office was responsible for overseeing this examination process. So Sutcliffe was put in charge of this task and he actually liked that job. Um, but he, after a while, it's, he thought it suffered from the fact that there was no standard text or syllabus for the courses that were being taught. So after about a year of this, his frustration with those circumstances led him to propose not only a formalized syllabus, but the commissioning of a textbook that would cover that syllabus. And to his astonishment, Director Simpson agreed that that was needed. And what's more, he, read, he thought that Sutcliffe should write the book and he wanted it done in six months. So he further suggested to Sutcliffe, I don't think you should come to the office every day while you're writing this book. You should work on that at home. Who says no to such a thing? Not Reginald Sutcliffe. So in the spring of 1937, the writing and the six months of at-home leave to do the writing began. The important thing for our field and for all of us is that this project gave him time to do his first extensive reading in meteorology, a subject with which he was not academically familiar, even after a decade in the Met Office. So this was a huge thing. After the book was finished, he was posted to the climatology section of the office where he was supposed to write pamphlets describing weather around the world for admiralty pirate, pilots, pirates. He was horrified at this prospect. Such a mind numbing work, he couldn't do it. And he exercised his privilege earned through seniority to apply for another post. And he was assigned as an instructor at the Royal Air Force School of Naval Reconnaissance at Thorny Island on the South Coast, effective March 30th, 1938. This was a dream come true for him and Ele Evelyn. And he began to think about unsolved problems. And as a long serving forecaster, chief among these was understanding the development of cyclones and importantly, and anti-cyclones. And several landmark papers followed this time of self-education. So there's the book. It didn't come out for a year, but he had a chance to read and he started to think upon the reading. One of the first major contributions to theoretical dynamical meteorology from this period was a, a collaboration with Charles Durst at the forecast uh, at the meteorological office. The importance of vertical motion in the development of tropical revolving storms. I love the title. Tropical revolving storms are now commonly known as tropical storms or hurricanes. The problem discussed is that of the mechanism for the eviction of air from tropical revolving storms. And how do you do it? By examination of the equations of motion. Several pages into the text of this uh, paper, they have this uh, passage. If vertical motion occurs in the atmosphere in a region of horizontal temperature gradient, 
then ascending motion gives a component of wind from warm to cold and descending motion a component from cold to warm. What? Synoptic gobbledygook. Almost sounds like the very thing Sutcliffe was working against to try and rid the science of unrigorous uh, description. But what they do, Durst and Sutcliffe, is they look at this from the equations of motion perspective, particularly the frictionless horizontal equation of motion, which if you take the vertical cross product of it, you end up with an exact expression for the agiostrophic wind. If you further uh, expand the Lagrangian derivative into its Eulerian horizontal advective and vertical advective terms, you can start to investigate the contributions made by each. In particular, Durst and Sutcliffe looked at the vertical momentum advection, and they said, what if we assume the flow is geostrophic in the eye of the, or in the eye wall of the hurricane? Well, then we can write W dV dZ as W over FT K cross del T. A terrible assumption, of course, but a brilliant try at making dynamics tell you something about the way the atmosphere behaves. So we follow this through. If that's just the vertical advection term, you have to take another vertical cross product, and that becomes relatively straightforward that it's going to be K cross K cross del T, and it'll be uh, a coefficient of W over F squared T. And if you apply that to a situation that looks like this, where there's an X direction temperature gradient, where the temperature increases in the X direction, and the yellow oval indicates upward vertical motion, well, then your expression for the X direction agiostrophic wind, UAG, will be minus W F squared over T times DT DX. Plug in all the values here. DT DX is positive, W is positive. So the X direction agiostrophic wind has to be in the negative x direction. And that is eviction of air from the center of the tropical revolving storm, explained by dynamics, with the link being the geostrophic assumption. Phenomenal. Okay, first of its kind. And then in 1938, the same year, Sutcliffe writes his own paper and he kind of pushes this, this idea of the vertical cross product of the acceleration. Pressure changes are defined solely by the field of acceleration, that is by dynamical considerations. He exposes us in this text to the ugliness of the height coordinate version of the thermal wind expression. Uh, I know you can probably see this, maybe you don't see it well enough. It's DDZ of VG over T gives you something related to the horizontal temperature contrast. That's hideous. You can do something with that by just multiplying by T on both sides, but that's an assumption. Suckliff goes on and says, we're gonna look at this vertical advection term, but we're going to assume the motion is quasi-geostrophic. This is the first English language invocation of that phrase and the first application of it after it's invoked in such a paper. And that gives us the exact same terms we saw in the Durst and Sutcliffe paper. So again, this is practicality. Take those ugly equations, do anything you can to make them simpler and have them give you some insight. Fantastic. Um, step forward. And then 1939 comes along, a bittersweet year for Sutcliffe, of course. The publication of meteorology for aviators turns Sutcliffe, his name becomes synonymous with meteorology. This book is translated into at least two other languages, French, and now I can't remember which one, maybe Spanish, maybe Portuguese or Spanish. I'm sure it ended up on the shelves of um, Luftwaffe pilots as well. It's an excellent book. And uh, so that's what happens with uh, meteorology for aviators. And then Sutcliffe writes one of his most famous papers, Cyclonic and Anticyclonic Development, which is really the forerunner to the Sutcliffe Development Theorem, which later becomes the first omega equation. It follows that the criteria for development is that there should be a significant difference between the lower and upper level fields of divergence. And if you can make that happen mathematically, you might be able to um, suggest a three-dimensional basis for forecasting that's physical. And so this is how Sutcliffe does it. Again, starting with this notion of taking the cross product of the acceleration to isolate the agiostrophic wind. He subsequently, he then says in this paper, let's assume the wind at the top of an isolated column of the atmosphere is the sum of the surface wind plus the shear in the intervening layer. Assume all these winds are geostrophic, except those that will show up in the divergence term. Then you can show that the difference in the acceleration at the top minus the acceleration at the bottom is the result of an imbalance between two terms on the right-hand side, one of which is the shear uh, dotted with the gradient of the surface wind. And you've expand that thing, it's kind of ugly, you get four terms. But if you apply it to a situation like this, where there's only an x-direction temperature gradient, and then you've got a, a low-level set of isobars with geostrophic surface winds indicated by the gray arrows. One notices right away there's only a vertical shear, geostrophic shear, in the y direction. So any term that has us in it is out. And at the center of the cyclone, there's no such thing as a y derivative of the y direction surface wind. So there's no dv naught dy. 
the whole thing reduces to Vs times du naught dy and evaluated at the center of that cyclone. If Vs is positive, du naught dy is negative. So the whole term Vs dot del V naught points in the negative x direction. If you take the vertical cross product of that, you end up with this phenomenal result. Down shear of the cyclone, there is net column agiostrophic divergence. The air in that column is being evacuated. Up shear of the cyclone, there's net column convergence. The cyclone not only, therefore, propagates in the direction of the shear, which was a well-known empirical result, but it also develops while it propagates. And the vertical motion distribution is in couplets that are aligned along the shear. Phenomenal. The second term is the rate of change following an apostle of the shear vector itself. And one can imagine that by considering the same bundle of isentropes with a geostrophic confluent flow imposed upon them, indicated by the black arrows. Think about what happens at that purple dot under those circumstances. Those isentropes will be pushed together. The vertical shear vector in the y direction will increase. So there's dBSDT. If you take the vertical cross product of that, you get net column divergence on the warm side, net column convergence on the cold side. And these distributions of vertical motion will be strips that straddle the vertical shear. This is the transverse vertical circulation at an active region of frontogenesis, discovered well before Sawyer or Eliasson uh, got it. And I don't even think Sutcliffe quite saw what he had in that part of this expression. So this is a really important landmark paper. But that's it for 1939. He reaches the crest, the precipice of, of being an internationally famous scientist, and then Germany invades Poland. Within a month, this is Sutcliffe's um, uh, papers for his in, uh, induction into the uh, Royal Air Force Volunteer Reserve. And this is going to be tenable for the duration of hostilities initiated on October 10th, 1939. So that's his description document. And so this begins Sutcliffe's long service in the war. And he begins, he leaves from Thorny Island and he goes to Bomber Command headquarters in London. And then in November of 39, he goes to Arras in northern France. And that's where the British Expeditionary Force has its headquarters. But that doesn't last too long. Uh, after the phony war ends, finally, in, in April, and the Germans are on the move, first in Denmark and Norway, and then to uh, Belgium and France in early May, they make rapid progress, as everybody knows. And on May 17th, the headquarters at Arras was moved 70 miles west to Boulogne, where safety seemed assured. But only five days later, Boulogne was captured, and Sutcliffe was evacuated with 4,500 of his colleagues um, on the 23rd of May back to Dover. But that was not the end of his service in France. He was sent back across the front uh, to Orléans on the 5th of June and then uh, drove a contingent down to Salon by June 7th. And this was part of Operation Haddock Force, which had as its objective bombing industrial targets in northern Italy, particularly Milan and Turin. And, uh, but when they started to get operations underway on the night of June 11th, the French suddenly got cold feet and the whole thing went to hell. And they eventually there was no particular activity at all for that week, but it was a harrowing week. And they left uh, Marseille for Gibraltar on the 18th of June. This was after the capitulation. And then they didn't leave uh, Gibraltar till the end of the next week. And by late June, the BBC was reporting that all remaining British forces in France had been returned to England. And Evelyn was quite aware of the fact that her husband was not among those who had been returned to England. She was in Oxford staying with her sister. So imagine the joy when on July 1st, 1940, at a time when U-boats were doing great damage to Allied shipping in the North Atlantic, this was the worst summer of that damage, this telegram came on the 1st of July, 1940. Just arrived, feeling grand, see you soon, love Reggie. Nine words. And this lifted the spirits of the Sutcliffe home in Oxford to such an extent that 75 years later, Ellen, who was only four and a half at the time, could remember it like it was yesterday. Sutcliffe was given a week off, generous, and uh, until July 10th. And then he was posted as Chief Meteorological Officer at Bomber Command uh, HQ at High Wycombe. There was nothing for him to do. And by October 7th, people who knew that he was good, didn't want him wasted, they posted him as a Senior Meteorological Officer at Number 3 Bomber Group at Exning, Newmarket. And he served there continuously for three and a half years. They lived in this house. And the family stayed together. This was a great luxury uh, for the Sutcliffe family. And not everybody um, in, during the war service had this opportunity. But they stayed together for three and a half years uh, while he was the senior meteorological officer at Three Group. He was mentioned in dispatches for the first time in late September of 1941. This is a high honor, of course. 
and then he won the uh, Order of the British Empire in January of 42. And here's Evelyn and uh, Ellen at Buckingham Palace in early July 1942 at the investiture ceremony. So that's quite an awesome picture to have. And the reason that he was catching the attention of the higher ups and winning these awards was because they were forecasting flight level wins at, at a level and at, with accuracy that almost nobody else was doing, apparently. And this was a function of Sutcliffe's really uh, eager and uh, energetic use of isobaric coordinates in the analysis framework that was going on at three group. So um, he didn't invent isobaric coordinates. That's not really, uh, no one would say that, but he was aggressive in employing them and really trying to milk them for insight. And that's some of this uh, flight level wind forecasting came from that. So he wrote a companion set of meteorological office memos. This was the first one uh, in July 43, construction of upper ice, or 42, I have the date wrong construction of upper isobaric contour charts. The second one was written in collaboration with flying officer Otto Godot, who was a Belgian scientist who um, had a couple of interludes of collaboration with Sutcliffe over the years. This was the first one. And this second paper was the really interesting one. The relative height of a given upper isobaric surface is a function of temperatures only. And its local change with time is determined by the isobaric change of temperature within the air column, which can be affected in a couple of different ways. You can have horizontal advection of temperature, you can have vertical advection, they called it convectional uh, change, or you can have diabetic heating, direct absorption or loss of heat. They elected to focus on the advectional part, of it, horizontal advection. And sea level uh, analyses during World War II were easy to come by, they were plentiful. And if you combined them with both real and proxy observations of the lower tropospheric temperature, and that's represented by the red dashed lines here, either acquired from the rare radiosonde, the not so rare flight level data, or extrapolation of air mass techniques that are no longer used, one, and there they are, one could generate a map of 1,000 uh, millibar heights and column average isotherm analysis, like you're seeing right there. And then in pressure coordinates, graphical addition could be used to construct the upper level isobaric distributions. And since the thickness contours, look at the 500 millibar heights in black here, and since the thickness contours in a given column were rearranged equally by horizontal advection accomplished by the 1,000 millibar wind or the upper level wind, which you don't know, then you could extrapolate the evolution of the thermal field from, the, from a new pressure analysis and then create a new 500 millibar analysis and make a really nice stab at flight level winds. So this was a huge advance for operations and Sutcliffe was recognized. And so he continued to incubate new ideas of analysis and incorporate new insights about those ideas um, throughout that three and a half years at uh, number three bomber group. And in late March of 1944, after months of behind the scenes maneuvering by the director of the meteorological office, Johnson, Sutcliffe was posted as the chief meteorological officer at the Allied Expeditionary Air Force at Fighter Command at Bentley Priory. This was a terrible move for Sutcliffe, unfortunately. He was posted, there were some weird rules at this time in the war where if you were, if you were at home, you had to wear civilian clothes if you were not in the military itself. And so he's posted at a extraordinarily high level military location in civilian clothes. And that's the that's a way to get him to get ignored. And it certainly it made him get ignored. Fighter command had very little input on the decisions regarding Overlord, which came just a couple of months later, though not exactly none. Stag credits Sutcliffe with a few key insights in that critical first week of June. But otherwise, it was a great waste of time for Sutcliffe. And then once the invasion occurred, Sutcliffe crossed the channel from Bentley Priory to Granville in late June of 1944. Paris fell in August, and so Sutcliffe followed. He lived in a stable at the uh, Palace of Versailles and had no particular responsibilities while there. Then he moved on finally to a reasonable post, and that was as the uh, senior meteorological officer of the Second Tactical Air Force. And that was October 44. They moved to Brussels. He was there for the Battle of the Bulge, and it was kind of scary in Brussels at that time. And then he moves to um, Munching Gladbach in March of 1945. And in fact, Sutcliffe is the forecaster in charge of the forecast for the um, airborne portion of Operation Plunder, which was known as Operation Varsity, the crossing of the Rhine in late March 1945. Here he is in a staged, he's on the left, a staged photograph uh, after the event. So these guys are all looking at this map, uh, hoping for the best, but they already had succeeded. So this was completely staged. And uh, he finally ends up after that in Bad Ilsen and spends the year after the war ends rebuilding the German Meteorological Service as the chief meteorological officer of 2nd Tactical Air Force, which became the British Air Forces of Occupation. 
And this work delays his demobilization for a whole year. He doesn't go back to England until April of 1946. And upon return to England, the Met Office is in need of reorganization as its ranks have swelled by almost 50% during the war. So for a period of months, Sutcliffe had no substantial responsibilities. And he took to organizing thoughts that he'd had uh, tinkered with during the war. And chief among these was his reevaluation of the development ideas. So it's led to the development theorem, the first omega equation. And again, he had think, thought all during the war about the vertical cross product acceleration and how that's related to the agiostrophy and vertical motions. And I, somehow, it, perhaps it never occurred to him that if you rearrange the left-hand side of this expression by a vector identity, del dot k over f cross dv dt is the same as minus k over f dotted with del cross dv dt. And oh, that looks familiar, perhaps. That's like the vorticity equation. And so you can talk about vorticity, local changes, horizontal advective changes being somehow tied to the divergence. And if you do, if you then do what Suckle has been doing for years by this time, apply this relationship at two different levels, you can say that difference between the divergence at the top of a column minus the divergence at the bottom is a function of the horizontal rearrangement of vorticity at two different levels and the Laplacian of the thermal tendency because the vorticity tendency is related to the thickness tendency. Amazing. And after, and this isn't the end. I mean, you get to this point, if you don't know the answer, you don't know how to get to the final line because what Sutcliffe does is quite creative and ingenious, but he ends up convincing, convincingly presenting an argument that the difference in divergences is related to the thermal wind advection of the geostrophic vorticity. This is an amazing insight, not only because it tells us something profound about describing the weather, but that it also is amenable to graphical analysis. So here's a quick example. Here's the geostrophic vorticity uh, from 500 to 900 millibars shaded in orange, and then the thickness in the same layer in red. I put them on the next diagram in a background gray, and then emphasize the positive advection of vorticity by the thermal wind in red and negative vorticity advection in blue. And that's the inverted 500 millibar vertical motions. Green are ascending, yellow are descending. And that's what you get from the Sutcliffe development theorem. Here's what you get from the GFS primitive equation forecast model valid at the same time. Pretty good replication of that vertical motion field, not only in its magnitude, but also its broad dis uh, distribution. So this work was fundamental to Sutcliffe's legacy, really, and it introduces, reintroduces the meteorological world to Sutcliffe. He won several awards for it, including the Groves Memorial Prize. It motivated the initial work in British NWP, which was quite in contrast to what Rossby and Chani were doing in both the United States and Sweden. They were collapsing the entire atmosphere into one level and using a barotropic model in mind. Sutcliffe insisted in the meteorological office, let's try this baroclinic model, two-level model, with the uh, insights provided by the development equation. So that was um, uh, quite a difference right away. Um, he also was elected to the Royal Society. And this, he was the first synoptic meteorologist, and really the first line forecaster for sure, to be installed in the holy pre precincts of the Royal Society. And this event put synoptic meteorology and weather forecasting into the constellation of respectable, rigorous physical scientists. I don't have time to read this letter that he wrote back to the chancellor at Leeds in response to the chancellor's letter to him congratulating him, but it's in the book, and it's a masterful, beautiful letter that he wrote back to him, thanking him for his interest in his success. He was made a companion of the most honorable order of the bath in 1961, and so here's the award itself, and there's he and Evelyn in front of... Uh, Buckingham Palace with Ellen and her husband Dick in June of 1961. The next summer, of the royal couple visited the new meteorological office at Bracknell, and here's Sutcliffe talking with the recently deceased Prince Philip about the 500 millibar map that day, and meeting the Queen on the same day in the office. Um, he was awarded the WMO Prize in 1963, and the citation said for his outstanding contributions to dynamical meteorology, his furtherance of international cooperation in the science of the atmosphere, and his leadership in research. In March of 1965, he traveled to the Whitcliffe Mount School for the last time to deliver his second Pearson lecture. And note the title of the talk on the ticket, Predicting and Controlling the Weather. They were still thinking that prediction and control were braided together in a serious way. Uh, Pearson is two people to his left. That's his science master, William Pearson. There's Sutcliffe with the Globe. He resigned from the meteorological office in the summer of 1965 in order to avoid working under B.J. Mason and to establish the Department of Meteorology at the University of Reading. And at the same time, he was finishing up a popular book on weather and climate 
that he had been commissioned to write in 1962. And I uh, noticed that his name was misspelled on the cover. And of course, while sending a letter of apology, the editors wanted to um, ask him if he would write a textbook, but he did not have the time to do it at this moment. And unfortunately for our science, he never had the time to do it later as well. And as I mentioned earlier, in the process of conducting the research for this biography, I was fortunate enough to make contact with the Sutcliffe family and to enjoy their company on a number of occasions. This is a picture from around Christmas time in 2014. There's Ellen and her husband, Dick, their daughter, Lucy, her husband, Nick, and their two boys, Sam and Rory, and then Ellen and Dick's daughter, Harriet, and her husband, Dave. We had a wonderful time together, and it was not, as I said, the only time. On a separate occasion, I met his daughter, Jenny, and her husband, Jacques, at their home in Rennes in France. And I also traveled to Pentry Halkin uh, to the Sutcliffe gravesite, and it's adorned with the first line of Shakespeare's sonnet 33. Full many a glorious morning have I seen. And the other 13 lines describe a number of weather elements. And considerably more detail on many of these stories and a host of others are contained in my recently released biography. And here's the cover of the picture. So I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. And I'm really thrilled that you gave me the opportunity to tell you about this new uh, book and to um, uh, breathe some new life into the profile of Reggie Sutcliffe. It seems a great injustice to me, he always has, that uh, his, his profile is so much below his uh, accomplishments and his achievements in our science. So thank you very much for your attention. Jonathan, for a really interesting talk, brought back quite a few memories of from my dynamics classes from undergraduate. Um, Sorry about that. No, no it's <laughs> fine. <laughs> Didn't say they were bad memories, <laughs> 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 though it, 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 I wasn't the best at it. Um, <laughs> but no, it was very interesting. I had to be honest. Yeah, you're right. I hadn't really heard about Reginald Sutcliffe too much compared to his um, other to other um, people of his time doing weather. So yeah, if anyone yeah. has any uh, questions in the chat, I will pass them on. See if I can see any. No, I can't see any here. Oh, hang on. Ah, okay. Uh, Jack Hopkins um, asks, was similar thinking taking place in the US during World War II? That is an excellent question, Jack. I, I'm not sure that such things were being thought about in the United States certainly not at the level that they were in uh, number three bomber group. Um, some evidence for that is that when the allies got together for the forecast for Overlord, quite a, quite a bit of the effort from the United States side was um, on an analog forecasting method that was, uh, a, you know, sort of being bandied about by Irving Crick from Caltech. So um, they were not thinking about, it doesn't seem anyway, at least the, the, the front the leading edge of, of American thinking in weather system science at the time was not really thinking about thermal winds and uh, vorticities and various things like that. Although Rossby's papers in 1939 and 40 had a lot to say about vorticity, nobody seemed to pick them up in the same way that Sutcliffe did um, at the end of the war in the United States. So that, that but I, I haven't done research to verify that, but that's my impression from a distance. Uh from Dave, we got were the ideas that Sutcliffe first identified mentioned by oh I'm not going to pronounce this one El <laughs> Elysian Sawyer Carney etc. I can't remember if um, I know okay. that probably I probably Sawyer was going to make reference to Sutcliffe's work in his 1955 paper on frontal circulations because Sawyer was hired by Sutcliffe in the meteorological research um, pod, uh, the, the research office of the meteorological office. They were really good friends, good colleagues. I'm not sure that Eliasson makes mention of Sutcliffe in the 62 paper, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did also. Um, it seems to me, Dave, that Sutcliffe didn't realize really what he had in that DVSDT term from the 1939 paper. And so he might be guilty of his own lack of recognition on that because I don't think he quite saw what he had. But I'd like to go back and, and take a look at those references, uh, those papers, and see if they referred to Sutcliffe. I'm certain Soya did. I'm not so sure that Eliasson did. From Leonard, uh, was he competing with Rosby in some way? 
That's a great question. It could be explored in the whole book. I think the, the relationship between Sutcliffe and Rossby was, was cordial, friendly, but competitive. And I think they really were competing with each other. Oh, we just lost a great historian on this person who many of you know, uh, and he, uh, would, he was of the opinion while I was doing this book, he was saying, you know, Sutcliffe gets more credit for the development theorem than he deserves. And I, I would sit back and say, well, who was the, who was the competitor, Anders? And he'd say, well, Rossby, of course. I said, no, it's not a fair thing to say. Rossby, he thinks, Anders thought that Rossby was the one who introduced Sutcliffe to thinking about vorticity. There's no particular evidence that makes that clear, except that the, lang the, the, the literature was out there in the 1940s. There was a um, Vince Oliver had made a statement at one point that uh, Sutcliffe had visited Chicago in 1944 and August of 44. That's not true. His military records makes it clear he never had an, uh, a hiatus from service during that time. So um, it's interesting. I think they were rivals and it fell on Sutcliffe's shoulders to write uh, a, some sort of a eulogy in the meteorological magazine for Rossby when he died in uh, 1956. So it was um, or 57. I forget what year it was. Anyway, they were. They were good friends, but they were rivals. And I think that would be an interesting relationship to explore. Were their first hand documents to, you know, first order documents to do it? Uh, going along the same kind of lines, I think uh, Dave asks, what was his beef with Mason? <laughs> oh, excellent question. I can't find that out. It's, uh, it's, it's quite remarkable that it doesn't seem obvious. Um, he had personal regard for Mason and Mason for him, but he didn't like Mason's kind of self-promoting side of his personality. And I'm making a guess about that. That's the best that I can conclude from the various sources that I've had access to over the time that doing the book. Uh, Mason was a remarkably successful and entrepreneurial person. He was uh, in charge of some people in, um, in, uh, in the Pacific theater in World War II at an extraordinarily young age, and he never really lost that edge. He picked up cloud physics because he didn't really know much about meteorology and he became a giant in cloud physics. So everything he touched, he, he was able to put to the highest level. And it seemed to have come along with a self-promoting personality. That's my best guess. And that turned Sutcliffe off because he did not have that kind of personality, which again is maybe related to the fact that his profile was well below his accomplishments. He didn't do much self-advertising. Uh, did he develop anything with Brunt? Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think there was any particular collaboration between Brunt and Sutcliffe, except that Brunt ushered in not only his meteorological career with the interview, but Brunt, I didn't draw attention to this, Brunt was the president of the Royal Society when Sutcliffe was elected to it 30 years after he began his career. So Brunt comes in at a couple of really important times in Sutcliffe's life, and there's a sort of a uh, an interesting resonance there, but there was no particular intellectual collaboration that they ever got involved in together. Anybody has any other questions? I think that's probably a good time to wrap up. Um, yeah, I don't see any more questions. So yes, thank you very much again, Jonathan, for um, a really good talk. It was really good. Thank you. And thank you again for the opportunity. I very much appreciate it. Excellent. And just to let everybody know, the talk will be available for free and will be published on the um, Royal Mets YouTube channel as well and the archives on the Royal Mets website too. So if you want to rewatch it, you can. <laughs> but otherwise, yeah, thank you again. And um, thanks everybody for joining us.